major innovations presented at the air show this year from Eurocopter. Number six. We're able to do more and more things with this platform that are just phenomenal that you wouldn't have even dreamed of before. A lot's going on when you're in battle. People are shooting at you, you're getting information from stimulation overload. So what you need now is a system that can evaluate all those uh, various stimuli coming in, prioritize them. The Apache today can operate as a quarterback on, on a football field. They can take in many different kinds of information, but they're calling the play. We can control other unmanned air vehicles. We can control where they are. We can fly them from either station in the Apache. With the sensors the Apache carries today, we can see and spot the enemy anytime, day and night, and they don't even know we're there. They can't see us, they can't hear us. And you can transmit that information to the 19-year-old green suitor on the ground looking at his handheld device, so before he goes around the wall and there's a bad guy there, he knows there's a bad guy there. I have a son that's one of those soldiers on the ground. They can tell the tone and the sound of an Apache when it's in the area. And they've told stories that, that they know everything's going to be okay because the Apache is there. So now he won't even be able to hear the rotors. He'll just know that they're watching because it could be an unmanned air vehicle watching, protecting him and, and covering he and his buddies. How cool is that? Number five. I didn't want to be in a desk job. We'd always talk about if you could do anything in the world, what would it be? And I was like, you know, I think I want to learn how to fly a helicopter. And so I did. My name is Natalie Jones and I'm a helicopter pilot for Ericsson Aircrane. Right now, we're in a firefighting configuration, fighting fires. It's such a dynamic and fluid environment. It's dealing with wind that's coming off of terrain or wind that's generated from an actual smoke plume itself. You always wanna make sure that you're making your drops into the wind. If you have any type of crosswind, it's gonna carry that water and influence where that drop is gonna go. It's a bit of a balancing act. We're predominantly a firefighting company, but we also do heli logging and construction. We're lifting anything heavy. Initially, when you're starting to learn how to fly a helicopter, it's hovering, and that's one of the first things that you do have to learn. There's three different controls that you're dealing with. One is the one that makes the helicopter go up and down. It's called the collective. Then you have the pedals, which controls your yaw, so it turns the nose left or right. And then you have your center stick, which is called the cyclic, and that's kind of your directional control. 
for about two years I was teaching other people how to fly and I'd gained enough experience that I was able to apply for a second-in-command position with a heavy operator. There weren't many females in the industry at all. I am a rarity. I remember my interview with the chief pilot and his first words to me were, why on earth do you want to do this? And I said, because this is it, this is what I want to do. I know I can do it too. One of the accomplishments that I'm most proud of working with Ericsson is the fact that I am their first female captain. In the civilian world, I met I don't know specifically how many female helicopter pilots there are, but it's even less. It's a very small industry. We work worldwide. So we travel around typically with three mechanics, two drivers, and there's always two pilots that are in the cockpit. I think anybody in aviation, they have a passion for it and they have a love for it. I quite honestly can't picture myself doing anything other than flying. This is it. This is what I'm going to do. If you think it, if you dream it, you can do it. My name is Natalie Jones and I fly helicopters like a woman. Number four. With its signature tandem rotors, the Boeing CH-47 Chinook helicopter is well known for its unmatched efficiency and reliability, having played a pivotal role in thousands of combat and humanitarian missions. But the aircraft, which just marked its 50th anniversary since first delivery, may never have taken off without the vision of a man named Frank, Frank Piasecki. The whole focus of his mind was on what are real world problems that need to be solved. Nicole Piasecki recalls her father's passion and perseverance. She says the aviation pioneer who invented one of the first helicopters while still in his 20s had a never ending desire to get it right to do it better. His mind just kept driving to new ideas, really focus on affordability, pragmatism, get the capability out fast. In the Boeing archives, aviation historian Mike Lombardi finds countless examples of Piasecki's prolific career. But it's the tandem rotor design, the same one on the Chinook, that really stands out. This dual rotor design helps the helicopter to fly to higher altitudes than other helicopters and perform in environments where other helicopters just can't go. For example, the tandem rotors allow the Chinook to be extremely stable in high wind conditions, while the rotor blade's placement gives more room to load cargo in unfriendly terrain. All the while, the aircraft can carry heavier loads than other choppers. What he loved most about the tandem rotor configuration was its ability to use 100% of the power dedicated to vertical lift, giving the helicopter, in almost all cases, an advantage in carrying payload in the hover. Piasecki says if her father were alive today, he would be proud of the legacy that lives on in the Chinook, including the many improvements. Over the years, Boeing has modernized the Chinook with new engines, a new fuselage, composite rotor blades, digitally enhanced flight controls, to name a few. The Piasecki says her dad would spend little time on the pass because there's more work to do. His advice? Keep going. Dad was very clear that he thought reinventing the wheel was a waste of time and money. He really was focused on how do you improve the performance of the product, how do you improve survivability and how do you make it more affordable? And I think that's exactly where the Boeing team is focused today. Number three. Two U.S. Marine Corps MV-22 Ospreys come home. Partially assembled near Philadelphia at the Ridley Township facility, this visit is giving those who build the world's first production tilt rotor aircraft a chance to see their work in action and meet those whose lives depend on it. Gloria Moss, a Boeing sealer, has worked on the V-22 program for 14 years. I'm very proud. It's an honor to be working on this program. The job must be right. We have to have it right to protect our men and women. The Marines from Marine Corps Air Station, New River, North Carolina, are using the Osprey's capabilities in military and humanitarian missions around the world. 
Faster and with greater range than comparable aircraft, the V-22 Osprey can carry 24 passengers and cover 700 nautical miles in just three hours as an airplane, then tilt its 19-foot rotor blades and transition to a helicopter, allowing current missions by the U.S. Marines, Navy, and Air Force to be accomplished. The users of the airplanes, the squadron leaders of teams of V-22 Ospreys, what they say is that this airplane has changed the way we fight war. And I haven't heard that before. It's uh, an amazing sense of pride that I get as program manager to see news reports on the TV of when we have rescued a downed pilot. Perhaps no one knows that better than the U.S. Marines of Marine Medium Tilt Rotor Squadron 266, who last March flew a trap or tactical recovery of aircraft personnel mission in Libya, saving the life of a U.S. Air Force F-15 pilot. We started hearing the down pilot talk on the radio and stuff. Like U.S. Marine Sergeant Mike DeMars and Osprey crew chief manned the 50 caliber machine gun on that mission and provided cover. We landed um, before I could even swing the gun out of the way uh, and lower the ramp and recon runs off. Uh, the uh, individuals running up to the aircraft uh, with his hands up and just happy to be there and us to pick him up. Some of the members of that mission recently visited the production line to meet the V-22 Osprey team. Handshake after handshake reminded the Boeing workers of the importance of their missions on the shop floor. Kind of get a smile on your face from ear to ear and you go, hey, I may have worked on that V-22 and it just saved a down pilot that was in hostile territory and, you know, and he's going back home to his family. Why? Because I helped build that product. While the Osprey is currently only fielded by the U.S. military, its speed and range of life-saving capabilities are quickly becoming known worldwide. The airplane is deployed on board ships so that if in a case like Haiti, where there's a devastating earthquake, or Pakistan, where there was some flooding last year, they can absolutely get there quickly uh, and help out those who are in need. Number two. Rosoboron Export and Russian Helicopters are presenting the K-52, a new generation scout attack helicopter. The K-52 day-night all-weather scout attack helicopter is designed to destroy enemy tanks, armored vehicles, and soft skin military equipment, manpower and helicopters at the forward edge of the battle area and in the tactical depth, as well as to provide target reconnaissance, target assignment and target designation for cooperating helicopters and army command posts. Its power plant includes two powerful VK2500 engines rated at 2400 HP each. The helicopter uses a high-performance coaxial rotor. An important feature of the K-52 is the absence of the tail rotor, which significantly improves the efficiency of helicopter control and flight safety. The absence of power consumption by the tail rotor, combined with a high-performance rotor, gives the K-52 a 20 to 25 percent advantage in thrust weight ratio over all known attack helicopters in the world. As a result, the K-52 offers unparalleled maneuverability and an unprecedented hover ceiling out of the ground effect of around 4,000 meters, which exceeds the hover ceiling of all known attack helicopters around the world by an average of 800-1000 meters. The service ceiling of the K-52 is at least 5,500 meters. Stores are mounted on six hard points. Increased maximum weapon load and longer maximum flight range with maximum weapon load are the competitive advantages of the K-52 over other attack helicopters. The airborne reconnaissance and target designation system includes electro-optical surveillance and sighting system and onboard radar capable of detecting and recognizing typical ground targets and determining their location around the clock and in any weather. 
as well as onboard communications system that provides air-to-air -air communications and transmission of reconnaissance data to command centers as well as to airborne and land systems cooperating with the helicopter. Operating experience suggests that side-by-side -side layout of pilots in the Ka-52's cockpit is most appropriate to conduct reconnaissance missions. The shared use of information coming from radar, electro-optical systems and navigation aids by the two pilots simultaneously reduces the search time and improves target recognition reliability. Number 1 To defeat radar, the Comanche utilized the stealth secrets first developed for the F-117 Nighthawk. There are no radar reflecting right angles on its outer fuselage, and all weapons are carried internally to help keep its stealthy shape. What's interesting about the helicopter is some of the things that achieve stealth actually make the helicopter better. Things like the retractable landing gear and the retractable weapons bays, that also makes it sleeker and faster. So once you've bought into the stealth part of it, you get other superior attributes. The main role of the Comanche is to give commanders an overview of the battlefield by providing up-to-the-minute information. Comanche is going to be basically their flying cavalryman. It's going to dart in and out, slash and cut, be a reconnaissance vehicle. As Comanche's two pilots gather data, their computer shares that data with other allied forces. When the Comanche finds the enemy, he's going to kind of direct like a quarterback to apply the firepower to defeat that enemy. Engineering advances have also made the Comanche one of the easiest and most forgiving helicopters to fly. One thing the Comanche brings that other previous generation helicopters can't bring to the table is the pilot can maneuver the Comanche in virtually any axis without fear of exceeding any limits. Although it will be used primarily for reconnaissance, the Comanche will also be armed for self-defense. The Comanche is capable of carrying a wide array of weapons all the way from guided missiles using a laser guidance system, uh, heat-seeking missiles, which would be more of an air-to-air -air weapon, or unguided rockets, and also the latest Hellfire is pretty much a fire and forget. In addition, Comanche's pilots can ask Allied aircraft to fire missiles their way, and can then take over and guide those missiles to their targets. If the Comanche is hit, its computer system can often fix itself by reassigning vital functions to undamaged computer cards. This is where the computer brain of the Comanche is. In support of its reconnaissance mission, Comanche can control as many as five unmanned aircraft. When the Comanche may be employed, it may have little vehicles that it launches out, so it has its own little eyes over the hill so it can see what's going on without putting itself at risk. Please don't forget to like and subscribe for new videos every day.